Welcome to Exhibition. And hello, Michael Cusack. Hello, Richard. Great to be here. Lovely to see you there in, uh, in your studio. And your exhibition is Kissing the Apple at Olsen Gallery in Sydney. Um, and we'll come to that uh, intriguing title very shortly. But on a much broader level to begin with, um, what would you describe as perhaps the, the, the main themes or elements that you've been exploring in your practice over, over the last few years, perhaps even the last decade or so? I guess if I come back to almost the beginning, when I was at art school, which was 20 years ago, I started late, um, I was sort of doing minimal, minimal still lives. And, you know, there was a, a touch of realism in there. But I, the forms kept breaking down and more and more, and they became very abstract, or pure abstract, as it were. And, you know, it was a, about discovering space, and it was a real push into pure abstraction. I didn't want them to be anything real. I was trying to discover a new way of making marks that didn't have a reference, per se, directly to something. Where do you think this body of work sits in that exploration? In this process, for this exhibition, there was a lot of drawing involved. Normally I have sketchbooks that I draw in. They become influences for the work. But in this case, I was actually drawing straight onto the canvas. So it was a much more direct process for me. So there's a lot of marks there that, I, that are not usually evident. Um, so it was, I guess, a little bit more active. That process, though, of, of multiple layers of, of palimpsests that we can see through semi-transparent paint has been part of your practice in various ways for a long time. But maybe, as you say, not so much with the drawn marks. Uh, yeah. Does that feel very different for you? Yeah, it was, it was refreshing. I think you're always looking to refresh every time. You don't, you know, I'm not interested in doing what I did last time. I like to recreate a new field, as it were, or a new space. So always trying to upend how I was doing it previously to find a new way in. And it's the process that I really enjoy is the, the mark making and getting in there. Would it be fair to say that, that these works are perhaps more structural in their nature than, than some of the works of past years? If we're specifically looking at this body of work, it sort of references a few architectural shapes or yeah, architectural shapes or models, as it were, um, that I've held on to for a number of years that come in and out, where you know, I'm using shadows or um upending space so it's not logical i don't want it to so i'm kind of put, putting the shadows in the front and the, the structures at the back and you know kind of messing around with all that because i don't want it to be a place i want it to be a sort of a new place are there particular um philosophies or, or principles of architecture or even architects uh that that have specifically influenced you uh, not specifically, you know, maybe, you know, any great city you go to in Europe, I know I did a residency in Paris a number of years ago, that still has a residue, so the, you know, the architecture there. I would say, you know, to, to jump from all of the actual physical architecture, it's more to do with language almost and the breaking down of space. Now, you may or may not know that I'm a great fan of Samuel Beckett, and, you know, I did a master's on Beckett and abstraction. Mm. And I'm interested in the philosophy of breaking down language in the same way breaking down painting. What does that perhaps say about the way in which you have used paint over the years? Because there does seem to have been a language of your own that has developed in in, in the type of paint that you've used and the way in which you've created those layers and transparency, which may have, ha, have been used in various structures over the years, but a lot of that language has been constant. 
that's the push pull of using the material. I mean, I love paint and I love testing out what it does. You know, that's like a writer would test out words. I'm sort of testing out how it comes together or how it sits with, you know, how one color sits with another. It can be as formal as that. So in terms of those um, very distinctive uh, looks of veils of color sometimes uh, sitting over the top of, of, of others, yeah. Are those things that you deliberately work towards and then utilize or, or, or are they essentially happy accidents? Yeah, that's a good question. They're essentially happy accidents. Obviously the tools are there, the paint is there to do that, but it's not formalized. I'm not, you know, planning it out. It is happenstance in the studio. It's what happens if you do this or you do that. And it's never a deliberate act. It's more that, you know, I never actually finish a painting. It's just when you come into the studio, you kind of know that it's finished or not. Mm. I can be working on a, on, a, on a painting and trying to finish it and be hopeless at that. But, you know, one day you walk in and you know there's nothing else you can do to that painting to make it any better. It's a dilemma that seems to... Um... <laughs> be a, a challenge for, for so many artists, that sense of yeah. feeling when something is completed. Can you give your, your personal, I, I guess we all have different versions of it, but your personal sense of what it is that falls into place that gives you that message of completion? The process, I have to come back to the process again because I layer up a lot, I put a lot of material on there. But the, um, to arrive at a painting, I have to almost take it all off. And it's not the addition of paint or not the addition of material that makes a painting, but actually it's a reductive process. So it's almost the less and less to, re to get to some form of clarity where something new has arrived that I haven't seen before that has, you know, I don't want to say shapes working against each other or beside each other, but something has happened there that I don't know about that is intriguing and stays there and still moves. You know, a successful painting is elusive at the best of times. You emphasized uh, earlier the, the importance of, of exploration, of, of finding yeah. and exploring new things. And uh, the exhibition previous to this one certainly seemed very exploratory because almost all of the works were very subtle and almost entirely, but quite clearly not entirely, white. So what yeah. was happening there? <laughs> well, when I started out 20 years ago, um, I started with white paintings and I was doing that at art school. I was interested in working in what you would label the all whites. So it was paintings almost without color so that you're exploring, you know, very subtle tones and the structures had to stand up or survive without the addition of color. And so there was a lot to explore there in terms of the all whites. And it's always been on my radar. And, you know, I still, I make a lot of work in the studio that doesn't come out of the studio. And it's important for me to make that work, to make paintings that leave the studio. Um, but I wanted to get back to doing a show with the old whites again. And it seemed like a good time to do it. I had the opportunity to do the Olsen Annex last year. Let's go uh, to the, the title now of this show, Kissing the Apple. Where did that come from? <laughs> it's a good question. Um, Kissing the Apple, it's actually a throwback to um, a music is a musical reference there. There's an English band called Pale, Pale Saints. They were around in England. They're from Leeds in the 80s. Uh, they had a song called Throwing Back the Apple. And it's sort of a, a misquotation of that in a way, because I didn't want to just quote that because it would always reference that. So yeah. I kind of changed it to Kissing the Apple because it was quite poetic and it also it was, yeah, it was intriguing enough to know, well, what does that actually mean? And I'm very interested in how language plays out in terms of titles of shows and 
um, titles of paintings as well. Yeah. Going to the, uh, the, the titles of uh, works, many of them seem to have a, a European reference in this exhibition. Yeah. Uh, Prado, Fresco, Geneva, yeah. Le Bon, <laughs> um, but, but then also um, Rickshaw, which is, doesn't sound so European. No, uh, well, I just, like, I just like the word rickshaw because I think it's such a strong word and it comes off the, out of the mouth like rickshaw. It fly, flies out of there. So I like the sound of those words. So they're not actually, they don't, they're not represent, they're not meant to represent the painting. There's some ways to throw you off. It's an, another abstraction. The language, that language is an abstraction itself like the paintings are. And one of the uh, one of the largest uh, works, if not the largest work in the exhibition, um, is simply entitled Sluice, uh, which seems completely different again. Yes, it's a kind of different type of word and a different sound and a different language than the you know the Italian type ones, and it's just you know a word that's been in my journal for a while that I've picked up along the way, and. It just has a nice connotation to it. There does seem to be um, uh, an austerity to that particular work, Sluice, uh, compared with some of the other works in the, in the exhibition, and yet it is the largest work in the exhibition. Yeah. How do you, how do you balance those two things? That work was created off the canvas. It was created on the floor, um, as opposed to normally I work on stretch canvas. Sometimes I work on you know on the floor unstretched mm. so that one was created that way it still had structural shapes in it it's just quite a you know it's a balance between the two shapes with uh, linear structure in between and it's quite flat and yeah it's quite more, a little bit more ambiguous than the others i would say what are your observations about the 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 solidity of the structural forms around many of the works. There are quite large, quite solidly dark forms in, in most of the works, which almost seem to hold them together. What are your yeah. observations about that? Um, I don't like to be too specific about that, as I'm not, not as if I'm giving away big secrets or anything, but there is a big black shape, quite a large one that's in a few of those works. And that's actually a shadow from Paris. It's actually from a picture I've taken and it's between two buildings and you know in Paris they've got lovely in-between bits in their architecture. So it's actually that shape which I have carried around and it's almost like well let's throw that on the top. We can still hear uh, in your voice a little of the Irish lilt, yes. um, uh, indicative of, uh, of your birthplace in, uh, in Dublin, uh, but you now uh, are living and working uh, near Mullumbimby, uh, near Byron Bay in the, the north coast yeah. of New South Wales. H how much of a, an influence is location in terms of how, and how you work and what you produce? Well, I think when I first, um, I lived in, when I first came to Australia in 1982, I think it was, I lived in Sydney for 10 years, but I wasn't actually painting then. I was working in photographs and different things and I didn't go to art school till I was in my thirties. But when I moved up to the North Coast, the landscape is so beautiful up here. And driving through the landscape, I don't know if you know the North, Northern Rivers and North Coast, you know how it's dotted with all these, you know, trees and it was in my vision. I didn't want necessarily to be painting landscape paintings, but my first shows at the time when I was up here were all landscape because I just couldn't get it out of my vision. It was there. So it was almost like I had to clear the decks, clear it out um, to see things in a different way to get back into working in abstract form again. But um, growing up in Ireland was very uh, influential and, you know, it wasn't about painting so much, but it was about writing and, you know, we all wanted to be writers if we were living in Ireland, it seemed to be. Um, but that was a very strong connection for me and Ireland is still a very strong connection to the work. So it's kind of a homage to that. Well, 
certainly what you have given us today is a very clear sense of connection to the works in this exhibition. So, Michael Cusack, thanks for sharing the exhibition with us. Thanks, Richard. Thank you very much.